If you have your Bibles this morning, take them and find with me Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at Nehemiah chapter 8 in the start of revival. And God's word had convicted the people as they stood there at the water gate. And while they had felt that conviction, it was time for them to have a festival. And so they went forward with that. But that, that, that time of rejoicing did not mean that uh, everything was done for them spiritually. They needed to think through some more things. And so they gathered together. And we're going to find here that they continued to read the word of God. And as they read the word of God, God's word, as it always does, continues to shine its light of truth into our lives so that we are more reminded of areas of weakness in our lives. And the more they read the word, we're going to find in verse 3, the more they had repented. And I think about uh, God's word, and I want us to begin by reading chapter 9, the first three verses here. But as we think about how God's word brings conviction into our life, uh, I'm reminded of the truth of of God's Word and what it says to us and what it shows us. I know that uh, with new technology, especially now with high-def cameras and high-definition high televisions, which have been around for a number of years now, it has uh, caused a lot of change in the pro TV production business. In fact, uh, low-tech television was pretty forgiving, and I was reading this, this week about a man who described how uh, with the old cameras, that with low resolutions that you could uh, put a lot of makeup on anchors and, and actors and actresses uh, to cover up blemishes, wrinkles, uh, other things that, that you're trying to cover up on TV. And even in the background, uh, they would have uh, basically vinyl or, or a backdrop with fake books on shelves. And with the, with the advent of the high-def television and camera equipment, uh, they had to begin rethinking all of those things because now everything could be seen with the unforgive, in front of the unforgiving lens of a high-def camera on television. So I think about that today and what that says about our lives. So often we think that we can sort of just kind of cover up or masquerade who we are, but God is the one who sees all things. And therefore, the answer to that is not to try to hide from God, but to be open with God and to confess our sin and to forsake it. And we have to be completely truthful to him. Let's look at what, how that worked out in Nehemiah chapter 9, the first three verses. The Bible says, Now on the 24th day of, the, of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. Then those of Israelite lineage, lineage separated themselves from all the foreigners, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for one-fourth of the day. And for another fourth, they confessed and worshipped the Lord, their God. You know, what we find here in this passage of Scripture, and I realize that chapter 9 of Nehemiah is a long chapter. We're going to kind of look at it from the 30,000-foot overview this morning. But as we do so, we're going to see the first thing they do is to uh, make the confession to stop wickedness. They make a confession before God that they are going to stop their wickedness. And in these verses, we're going to see that confession involves penitence. Now, that's a word we don't use very often. We talk about repentance. We don't you talk about penitence anymore. Uh, but penitence is the action of or the, the showing of remorse for our sin. It's a, a obvious sorrow about our sin. And when we look at God's word, we find that in these verses, they show their remorse. They, they fast, they put on a sackcloth, they put ashes on their head, which are, are kind of strange to us. But these were outward expressions of their inward feelings that they were sorrowful about their sins. In other words, what they were doing is they were bringing themselves low before God. And whenever we humble ourselves and bring ourselves low before God, God is lifted up in our lives. And so they were taking time to be holy. They were reading God's word. And as they read the word, it continued to show them sin and they confessed it. And by the way, if you want to grow spiritually, if you are going to be confessing sin in your life the way that you should, you have to read the word of God. And by the way, I think sometimes in our taking time to be holy, a lot of people try to read the Bible, but they don't pray. Other people pray, but they don't read the Bible. And you know what happens? Both of those things are wrong. You've got to do them together because uh, only through reading God's word can he show us what we need to do in response to him. So this confession 
involved about, it was involved uh, penitence, but it also involved prayer. Now, if you look at verse 4, all the way to the end of the chapter, basically verse 37, what you're going to find here is the longest prayer in all of the Bible. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 4, verse 4 to 37 is the longest prayer uh, in, in all of God's word. And what he does is he looks at the past, he reviews Israel's history in the past, and then he says, okay, where are we in the present? And there's some things we're going to do, especially this is where we're going to move a little fast this morning. But looking at this prayer, we're going to look at, uh, number one, uh, as he makes this confession, he begins by talking about God's rule, God's rule, how he rules over creation. You notice there he, he speaks in, in uh, verse 5 and following there, he begins to talk about the God who invented, uh, who created the heavens. And he talks about the one who is the host of heaven and all these various things. And as he does, what he's doing, he's talking about God's rule over creation and God's rule over their lives through the calling of of Abram. And what that reminds us, you kind of ask yourself a question this morning, why would we begin a prayer of confession by talking about God's rule over creation and God's rule over our lives by calling us to salvation? And I believe there's a couple of reasons for that because number one, one of the greatest sins in many of our lives is that we fail to understand that God is creator. And when we fail to understand that God is creator, I, I don't mean that you are an, are a, uh, an atheist. I, I'm saying that when you fail to recognize that God is the one who rules over creation, that causes you to worship creation rather than a creator. And so many, one of the problems that many of us are involved in, one of the sins in our lives, is that we are worshiping pleasures and we are worshiping possessions rather than the creator who made all things. And then we often forget the fact that not only is this rule evident in creation, but it is also evident in the calling of us to salvation. And we think that the fact that he called us out of darkness into life means that God has the ability to speak into our lives truth and we must live our lives under his lordship. God has rule over the universe. God has rule over our lives. And that also is most obvious in our redemption. If you notice there in verse 9, he says, you saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt. Now he begins now in these verses, verse, all the way down to verse 12, to speak about how God led them out of Egypt. And by the way, I, I again, not spend a ton of time here, but here's something to keep in mind. Just as God led them out of slavery and out of bondage in Egypt, Christ has done a greater and a second exodus for every one of us who were locked in the slavery to sin and death and hell. And he has led us out through his marvelous light and brought us deliverance. So we think about God's rule. We think about God's redemption. And we also are reminded of God's revelation. Look at verse 13. You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. The greatness of God's revelation in the Old Testament was seen when he came down on Mount Sinai and gave the Ten Commandments, when he spoke the law to Moses. Now, why did he give the law? Was it so that they could be saved by keeping the law? What was the purpose of God giving the Ten Commandments so that they could have a list of ten rules and if they kept those rules they could be saved? Absolutely not. In fact, God had already saved them when he gave them the Ten Commandments. God had delivered them from Egypt. That was their salvation. That was their redemption. Once they got to Mount Sinai, that is when God gave them the law. It wasn't so that they could be saved, but so that the saved might know how to live. And for us today, the Word of God, we, are, we should keep the law. Not because we're trying to be saved, but we're trying to know how to live as saved people. But instead of responding rightly to God's revelation, we find that the people of Israel were living in rebellion. Look at verse 16. But they, our fathers, acted proudly, hardened their necks, and did not heed your commandments. Now, as you continue to read here, you're going to find in verse 18, the very worst sin that was in the memory of Israel was the sin of the golden calf, the molten calf where they melted down their jewelry and they said, this is our God, and they worshiped him all the while while Moses was on the mountain. And as I think about our rebellion against God, we're just like Israel. We like to seem to go, we seem to go our own way. Uh, we like to make gods after our own choosing. But, but as we can think about the sins in our life, there were plenty of sins in the history of Israel, but there was this one sin that seemed to stand out to them above all the others. And they're Perhaps the, 
time when they committed immorality at Moab was, a, was another uh, point in their history where they were very grieved over sin. They would committed a heinous sin. But I think so many times in our life we can look back, and I don't know about you, but I can think about times in my life where there are just moments where I wish that I could just erase those things from my memory, that I could just forget that that ever happened, that I was ever capable of doing such a thing. And I don't know how many of you would say, I've got something in my past that I just wish I had never done, I'd never said, I'd never gone to that place. But listen, Jesus Christ, through his blood, as we just saying, is the one who brings forgiveness and cleansing. In fact, we find here that as he continues this prayer, that we see the relentlessness of God. Look at verse 18, and when they had made a molded calf for themselves and said, this is your God that brought you up out of Egypt and worked great provocations, notice verse 19, and yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. God is a relentless God. God is a God who loves you despite your failure, despite what you have done to sin against him this week. God loves you. God cares about you, and God is relentless in his pursuit of you because of who he is. In fact, there is nothing so great in all of this world as the mercy and grace and compassion of God. I love what 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. So I think about the story that is unfolded in the prayer of Nehemiah chapter 9. It is a picture of God's relentless goodness and God's relentless grace in pursuit of human guilt and sin. God continues to demonstrate his goodness towards us, even in the midst of our sin. As we read these verses, you're going to see instances of God's provision, instances of God's promises, instances of God's power and God's patience in response to Israel's prostitution and pride. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't deal with us as we deserve? You know, somebody once said that the difference between grace and mercy is this, that grace is when God gives us something we don't deserve. You know, grace is salvation, that God would save us. That's grace. We don't deserve it. But the other takeaway of that is that mercy is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve. The fact that we don't face hell by trusting Christ is an example of God's mercy. We deserve hell, but God doesn't always give us what we deserve. A mother once approached Napoleon and asked for a pardon for her son. And this time Napoleon, who was emperor, said, this is the second offense that your son has committed and justice demands death. The mother said to Napoleon, I'm not asking for justice. I'm asking for mercy. The emperor said, your son does not deserve mercy. The mother cried, sir, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And I ask and I plead for mercy. Napoleon said, well, then I will have mercy. Aren't you thankful that when we look at our lives and we see that we don't deserve God's grace, we don't deserve God's mercy, we don't deserve his forgiveness, but God is gracious and he relentlessly pursues his people. And we can see it through his rule, through his redemption, through his revelation, in spite of their rebellion. And then we see even the way he rewards them in spite of their waywardness. Notice there in verse 22, it says, more of you gave them kingdoms and nations and divided them into districts so that the possession, they took possession of the land of Sion and the land of the king of Heshbon and the land of Og, king of Bashan. So we read here, it's quite obvious that God is the one who was rewarding them. Even after their sin in the desert, God continued to bless them. Notice that as you read these verses here that speak about the conquest and the way that he rewarded them, that you know, there's not one mention of Joshua. Joshua was this, you know, we think of him as this great and fearless leader, and he was, but guess what? It wasn't because of Joshua that God gave him that reward. God is the one who is doing all the blessing in all of this. And, and, and then what happened? How did they repay God for the great blessings he brought in their lives? Probably about the same way that most of you and I repay God when God blesses us by, re, by more rebellion. Rebellion. 
which results in retribution from God. Notice there in verse 26. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their backs. Say, wait, we can live without this book. Just throw it in the garbage. The way many of us do. And he said, and killed your prophets who testified against them to turn them to yourself and worked great provocations. When we rebel against God, there are always consequences. He shows how they were subject to other people's. By the way, if you're a Christian here today and you're sinning and you're living in sin, God will punish you. And I speak from experience because God always punishes me when I think I can live contrary to the law and the word of God. But what God does is he brings us punishment on our lives, not because he hates us, but because it is through that punishment and it is through that suffering that we are driven back to the arms of God. Maybe that some of you are here today and God is using pain in your life to call you back to him. Maybe some of you are, have lived in sin and you're beginning to understand like the prodigal son that it's a whole lot better back in the father's house. It's time to come home. It's time to get right with God. God's purposes for your life are better than your own pleasures for your life. In spite of the retribution, there's a repetition. You notice there that verse 28 says, but after they had rest, they again did evil before you. It's amazing to me when I stop and I think about the history of Israel. Some of you have read through the Old Testament. Those of you who have grown up in church, you know the story. And it's just kind of repetitious, isn't it? Same thing again and again. God chooses these people. He blesses these people. He calls them to himself. And, and for a while they listen and God does great things. And then they sin. God punishes them. They come back. And it all happens over and over again. And you kind of think, these people of Israel, man, they, they were just... They were as dumb as a box of rocks. I, I mean, these people have no sense whatsoever. They, they just, they never seem to learn. A friend, when I look at my own life, I'll tell you, it seems like that same pattern is so obvious in my life. When I deal with people in the church, it seems that most Christians have that same sort of spiritual trajectory of this repetition, going from sin to sin to rebellion to punishment to coming back trying to give their life back to christ and turning and doing the same thing all over again but you know the apostle paul tells us that all these things in the old testament in first corinthians chapter 10 were written for our admonition upon whom the ages ends of the age have come but yet as adolf hoxley said the men that men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is the most important of all the lessons that history has to teach that men don't learn from history is the most important lesson of all, history. And how often it is in our lives that we see this same truth. Whatever you've been through in your life, whether it be failure or whether it be success, God is using that story. He is using those things to shape you into who you are today to prepare you for the future. Because what we're seeing here is we've come to the end of all this history of God's dealings with Israel. There's a lesson for them to learn in the, from the past that can be applied to the present. And I want you to know that God's lessons in your life in the past can be applied in the present. The spiritual life of an individual is kind of like the advance of a great army. The objectives lie ahead, but the provisions come from behind the objective of an army is always ahead but the lines go deep behind the line there so that the provisions are coming from behind in the same way God is calling you onward and upward but the strength that you have to go onward and upward comes from the supplies that God has given you in the past and I don't believe you can be faithful to where God is leading you in the future until you understand what God has done in your life. In the same way, I think we can see that even in the life of Christ. That if it had not been for the cup in Gethsemane, Jesus could have never faced the cross on Golgotha. And God is always using these things to shape us and to drive us toward him.
whatever you've gone through in the past is preparing you for what God, where God is taking you. But the lesson, the most important lesson of all is found in verses 32 to verse 37 here, that not only is there this repetition, but there is repentance. The people of Israel realized that not only had they experienced these things in the past, but in the present they were experiencing the same thing, and they had to do the old thing that had always been done to repent, to repent of sin and to turn toward God. Now, therefore, verse 32, our God, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who keeps covenant and mercy, do not let all this trouble seem small before you. And he continues to, to say here, verse 36, here we are, your servants today, and the land that you gave to our fathers. They recognize that they are in great distress. By the way, as the prayer moves from past to present, he begins to confess sin. And he can, begins to confess sin specifically. He, he names the sins. He, he gets specific about it. And he makes a straightforward confession of sin. I want to ask you, do you confess sin regularly? Just think about your own spiritual life for a moment. How much time do you spend confessing sin? Now, I don't just mean saying, God, forgive me of all my sin or all my sins. I mean, how much time do you spend naming individual specific sins? Some things in our lives seem to pile up quickly. There's five people in my home. Uh, my wife doesn't buy paper products. And let me tell you, the dishes pile up quickly. There are times when, you know, you, you cook, a, you have a big meal and you look and, and you have some people over and, and you're like, oh my goodness. There, there's not a place in the kitchen you can set something down. You got all these, it piles up so quickly. Laundry is the same way. But, but when you think about how quickly dishes pile up in the sink, just begin to think about how quickly our sins get piled up before God. And you know what many people do? They, they, never, they never take the time to wash them. Because the blood of Jesus Christ can, can forgive us and cleanse us from all our sin. But I believe God's word shows us that we ought to confess our sins. That we ought to keep short accounts with God. But I'm not saying that if you leave a sin out of your confession list that you're not going to be forgiven for it. But God, I believe, expects us as best as we can to specifically and individually name our sins so that we are aware of them and that we show the remorse that we need for our Sins. Aren't you thankful, though, that 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. The people of Israel had a confession to stop wickedness. But I want you to notice something else. They went from confessing, confessing sin to then making a commitment. Because if you don't make a commitment, then you'll just go back the same way that you've always lived. You can confess, oh, I'm sorry for this, but unless you make that commitment, you're just going to keep doing the same things again and again. And so what did they commit to do? First of all, they committed to separate from the world. They made a commitment to separate from the world. There in, in uh, chapter 9, you notice there in verse 38, it says, and because of this, we make a sure covenant and we write it. This is, this is really where they begin to make these commitments. And you find that uh, they have over there in chapter 10, verse 1, they have a covenant renewal ceremony. And now those who place their seal on the document, and then they signed it, they said, in writing publicly, we're going to make these commitments. By the way, this just goes to show it is never wrong to make a public commitment. There are 84 men in this chapter who put their seal, who put their signature on this document to say, this is what we're going to do. There's nothing wrong with, not, with making a commitment not in ink, but in the water of baptism to say, I make a commitment of my life to follow Christ. There's nothing wrong with publicly saying, I I'm going to make a commitment to live my life for the Lord. There's nothing wrong with saying, I'm going to make a commitment to the church of God by standing up and saying, I pledge to be a member of this church. But their commitment here was to separate from the world. No notice there in verse 28 of chapter 10. Now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the Nethanim, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God. Basically what they're doing here is they're separating themselves. They, they, they mentioned more about this down in verse 30. But in other words, they were saying, we are not going to compromise our religious identity. 
we're going to be distinct from the world. And the same instructions are given over in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Now, when God calls us to separate from the world, he's not telling us not to communicate from the world or to go live on a commune in Utah. He's telling us not that we cannot communicate with the world, but that we should not conform to the world. That's the issue, is conformity. And, and you start thinking about how that looked in Old Testament Israel when a man and a woman who were, uh, one being Jew, one being Gentile, when they married, so often here's what would happen, as in any marriage, is that there's conflict when there's two different worldviews. When there's two different worldviews, there's conflict. And, and then what happens is, and if the conflict's ever going to be resolved, then there has to be compromise. And then once the compromise has occurred, then there is conformity. And friends, if you think as a Christian that you can go and wed the world, there's going to be the same problem. There's going to be an initial conflict until you make a compromise. And once you begin to compromise on the word of God, you have conformed to the world. And rather, we are called to transform the world by separating from the world, but speaking to the world. And I believe that uh, so often in our time today that we're called to separate in terms of both our belief and our behavior. For example, in our belief, we cannot be people who are identical to the worldview of the world. We have to be distinct. You know, we have a, a world today, and if you turn on the television, the idea is that all roads kind of lead to the same mountain. That, that God is just sort of the God of every single religion, and that all religions are equal expressions to get to God, but that's not what my Bible says. John chapter 14, verse 6 is the litmus test of orthodoxy that says this, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That's Jesus speaking. Jesus Christ is the only way anybody, anywhere, ever has been, can be saved. And we only have to make sure that we are separate in our beliefs but also in our behaviors. We, make a, 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 we ought to be different from the world. One of my favorite uh, singers from many years ago was a man by the name of Ernest Tubb. Anybody remember Ernest Tubb? Okay, well, a few people that still remember uh, him. But uh, anyhow, he had a, a great song one time. It was called Saturday Satan, Sunday Saint. And isn't that a picture of how many people are. Who we are Monday through Saturday is such a difference in who we are on Sunday morning. But in our beliefs and in our behavior, we must separate from the world. And so not only do we make a commitment to separate from the world, but we make a commitment to submit to the word. Notice there he says in verse 29, they, these joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered to a curse and an oath to walk in God's law. Notice that they walked in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his ordinances and his statutes. They said, we're going to make a commitment to submit to the word of God. Now, that was especially important in their day because there were two of the Ten Commandments that people all around them were breaking. Many people were breaking the first commandment, which said, you shall have no other gods before me. They did that when they married other people and then adopted those gods. And secondly, many people were buying and selling on the Sabbath. They were breaking the fourth commandment to honor and keep the Sabbath day. Now, when you think about what that meant for them, if everybody was coming to town, all the Gentiles were coming to town on the Sabbath, and they were going to go and break the Sabbath by selling, I mean, you can see why they were doing it. That was the way they made their money. So in order not to go to the market and not to buy and sell on the Sabbath meant that it was risky business, that now they might not be able to make income. They may not, may not, might not be able to buy food and put a roof over their head if they did not do these things, if they didn't stand against the world. But they said, no, we're going to submit to the word. We're going to trust that God's word is enough. Like the old hymn proclaims, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the Seth, the Lord. Will you trust that God's word is sufficient? And when you do, like he says in verse 30, it's going to bring about a blessing in your life. It'll keep your children. It'll be a testimony to your children to keep your children from going out into the world. And you'll be able to say like Joshua, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. 
See, these people, they made a confession to stop wickedness. They made a commitment to separate from the world. They made a commitment to submit to the word. And I want you to notice they did a final thing here. In verse 10, they, excuse me, in chapter 10, verse 32, they made a commitment to support worship. Notice there it says, and we also made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one third of the shekel for the service to the house of our God. Go down all the way down to verse 39. I love the closing phrase of verse 39. He says, we will not neglect the house of our God. They said, we are going to be people who support the worship of the Lord. And we're going to do that through a couple of ways. We're going to do that through stewardship. And you find in here they talk about in verse 32, they talk about uh, giving uh, this financial gift. In verse 35, they talk about first fruits. In verse 37, they speak of tithes. And this same refrain is found all throughout Scripture. It's in the Old Testament in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, where it talks about bringing the tithe into the storehouse. It's in the New Testament when the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16 that on the first day of the week, each of you lay something aside in terms with, in, in keeping with his income as the Lord prospers him. And all throughout Scripture, there is a commandment to systematically and sacrificially support the worship of God. I've said all I'm going to say about that this morning, so you can all breathe a sigh of relief. But not only is he calling him to support worship through stewardship, but also through service. Again, look there at verse 39. We will not neglect the house of our God. The same refrain is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We live in a day when people are neglecting the house of God. But do not neglect the house of God in your attendance. When the fact that if you're revived spiritually, you're not going to neglect his house and his worship. What about you? You may be here this morning. But have you been guilty of neglecting God's house? Maybe you're watching online this morning. Maybe you're sick and you've got a good reason not to be in God's house. But are you neglecting the house of God regularly? One of the things that I've found in this last few years as serving as a pastor, not just in the last, not just since 2020, but over the last five, ten years, a trend that I've noticed, and it's also not only something I've noticed personally, but it's there's statistics and studies that have shown this to be the case, is that church attendance has has changed dramatically. One of the things that was used to use to measure church attendance was how many people attend regularly and faithfully. And, and if you, most people who would say, I'm a faithful attender of such and such church, they would, they would describe themselves as a faithful attender if they came to church maybe three or four Sundays a month. Do you realize that today people who consider themselves to be faithful church attenders now consider themselves to be that if they attend maybe once every four weeks or once every six weeks? It's changed. The amount of attendance has changed. I've been here now two years. A few weeks ago, I said I've been here one year. I had one of those moments, you know, those you just forget. But, but in the last couple of years, God has been so good to this church. I, I, I don't say that in any way in, in regard to me. I've just, I've just been thankful that I've been able to see and experience some things God has done. But, but when I say that, we, we've had just shy of 200 people join the church in the last two years. Now, now that's, that's a great thing, but guess what? Our average attendance hasn't gone up by 200. Now, now the good news is, is that our attendance now, our average attendance is greater than our pre-pandemic attendance. But it hasn't gone up by 200. And why is that? Because while people are coming and the people that have joined, most of them are still involved, but, but they only come, we only have a, a sampling of our people each week. Because nobody ever, it seems like they all can figure out how to come at the same time. <laughs> Now, now don't, don't, by the way, if you're, if you're one of these people, I don't want you to think I'm just attacking you because, you know, I, I realize that, that it's, there are some that are worse than hit and miss. There are some, some people that only come to church three times in their life. They come when they're hatched, when they're matched, and when they're dispatched. <laughs> for baby dedication, for their wedding, and for their funeral. That's about it. But, 
You know, you know, again, like I said, I'm not trying to put anybody down. I realize that even the most faithful people are not, are not perfect. None of us are perfect. Your pastor's not perfect. You know, the fact is, is that uh, the church is the only organization on earth that you have to confess to being bad before they'll let you join. So the hell's angels, I guess. And, and, and so while it's not perfect, there ought to be a faithfulness and a commitment to be part of God's house. We, we ought to show that we're willing to, to, to join the church and support the work of the church in spite of all the problems, in spite of all the failures, because God calls us to do that, to say we will not forsake the house of our God. Now, why should you love the church? Why should you be committed to the church? Because Jesus loved the church, and Jesus was committed to the church. I heard a story about uh, Dr. Ellis Fuller, who was once the president of Southern Seminary, but he was also, in, back in the 1930s, he was the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, where Charles Stanley has most recently served for many years. But he told a story once that he was visiting in the home of a young couple there in the church in Atlanta, and as he was sitting in their home, he, he said he noticed a very nice home, beautiful house. This was quite a quite affluent, well-educated, healthy young couple. And he said that he noticed that they had this little dog in the house, this little poodle, and that dog ate out of a special bowl. He had a special bed, uh, special food, everything about this dog. They just pampered this dog. And, of course, some of you are thinking, what's strange about that? Well, that was 1930s, okay? Not everybody did that back then. And uh, another thing about the 1930s, people didn't care what they said a whole lot, I don't think, as much. So, so this guy said something that you definitely don't ever say when you're visiting somebody. But he asked the question. He said, let me just ask you a question. He says, you've got this beautiful home. You seem like a great couple. You're, you're showering all your love and affection on this little dog. Seems like to me that you all ought to have a, a little child to be showering this affection on. But he said the moment he said it, he knew he had said the wrong thing because the wife just burst into tears and, and got up and left the room. The husband said, well, pastor, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we did have a son. We had a child, and the doctor has said that that's the only child my wife would ever be able to have physically. That little boy died. But that dog was our little boy's dog. And he loved that dog with all of his heart. And because he loved that little dog so much, that's why we love that little dog so much. What I'm trying to say, folks, is this. Well, Jesus Christ, he's alive. He is in heaven. But there's only one thing he left here on this earth, and that's his church. Despite all its failures... Despite all its foibles, despite all its flaws and failures, Christ loves the church and he's committed to the church. And if you love Jesus, you're going to love his church. So I think about the confessions and the commitments in this passage. I'm reminded of what one scholar he said. He said, with the renewal of the covenant came a renewed relationship with God. Your commitments and your confessions and your personal life ought to bring you closer to God. Every time you confess sin, that sin is no longer between you and God. Every time you make a commitment to God, that's drawing you closer to Him. And I want to encourage you to make a commitment with God. I want to encourage you to make an appointment with God every day to say, I'm going to commit to putting God first in my life. Maybe you have to set a reminder on your phone or put a date on your calendar. Would you make a commitment today? Would you make a commitment to separate from the world, to submit to the word and support the worship of the church? Now, I know some of you are thinking, David, I've made commitments before. I've made commitments. I've made promises to God, and I've broken those promises. I've failed so many times. I don't want to do it again. There was a great British preacher by the name of Alexander White, and I want you to listen to what he said. He said, the victorious Christian life is a series of new beginnings. Every day is a new day. You might have failed miserably yesterday. You might have failed this morning, but every time God's word is preached, there's an opportunity to do something different, to grow in our relationship with Christ 
As I said earlier, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. We could go on piling up and listing the sins of Old Testament Israel. We could think about the sins that we have committed again and again in our lives, 70 times 7. But guess what? The blood of Christ that we spoke about a moment ago is able to forgive you to infinity times infinity. Would you come before him in confession this morning? Would you get in on your knees before God and say, God, forgive me of my sin and my failure? Would you commit to living for Christ publicly, rededicating your life? Maybe as we sing this invitation, some of you would say, let us not forget or forsake the house of our God. And you'd say, I want to make a commitment to unite with this church here at Emmanuel that I would not forsake the house of God. As we stand across this room this morning, you come, whatever decision God is calling you to make, would you respond to him by making confession and commitment to God?